was great. I was like, fuck, I didn't even go home. That scouting report was so good, now it's really good. I'm scared, I'm just broken. Well, thank you, we appreciate it. Thank you. So when you get to Dago, <clears throat> we talked about the environment, the yeah. environment at uh, Lincoln. I talked to, uh, I interviewed Andrea Bird, Paris Johnson. They talked about how it was at the cave back in those days. Yeah. So you tell me about those days. Um, you know, I've heard the legendary stories about when Chardé was in high school and obviously the sustained success they had over that period. But tell me about how, you know, put me there with, with that environment and that feel of, of, of the cave rocking you know, back in that era. It was the closest thing to Lincoln I've ever felt. I was like, ooh, this is it's close. It ain't it, but it's close. Um, again, super hot. Uh, the acoustics, phenomenal. It's a shooter's gym, man. Honestly, it's a maker's gym. Let me say that. Not a shooter's gym. It's a maker's gym. Um, if you can't play in that environment, you don't need to have a basketball in your hand. That's reality. I mean, every kid in San Diego County should want to play a game there. Uh, the principal back then, uh, who, who was the ASB advisor at the time, the way he marketed the games was unbelievable. I mean, it was lines standing outside waiting to get in. Uh, he had the tunnel out where the team would run through the tunnel, through the cheerleaders, to the middle of the court. He had a balloon flying around in the gym, uh, dropping candy on kids. Uh, the Caver Crazies, they're, being, they're, they're like the Cameron Crazies. You know, you announce the start lineup for the other team, they had the newspapers up. You know, it was classic, man. It was just... Uh, I want to say the show at San Diego State stole is really the Caver Crazy. <laughs> I believe <laughs> it. I could believe it. We saw the Caver Crazies first. And in all honesty, I truly believe that's plagiarism and its finest. I truly believe they stole their whole gimmick from watching San Diego High. Uh, because it was what the show does now is what San Diego High was doing in the early 2000s. It was crazy. But and great you're coaching. You're coaching. You're coaching. Boys JV. Boys. Yeah, I'm the so, boys JV head coach. Walk me through the lead up to you becoming the girls coach there. Oh, man. So had a great time with Kenny. Again, shout out to Kenny Roy. Runs a prep school now in Oklahoma. Uh, Marlon Wells ended up leaving. He ended up stepping away and going for bigger, better opportunities at, at the Bishop School. And they asked me to take over the program then. I'm in my 20s. Um, and never coached girls 20s. before. Never. I mean – Worked out, you know what I'm saying? Like, I helped Kenny at Hoover. Uh, once he became the girls' head coach, we were, you know, boys and girls basketball was a family. So, you know, my little niece played at Hoover. She ended up coming to Dago. She was the first girl that I really, like, trained. Well, little Tiana, little T is what we call her. Uh, so, yeah, I really – and then, you know, we had big Tiana, who you work with at Mira Mesa, the volleyball coach. Those are, like, the first ones, them, Nakia Charles. Uh, but I never really – I never coached an entire girls' team. It was just workouts. So they asked me would I take over. I was like, nah, like I'm not ready to be nobody's head coach. I'm still in my, my twenties. I'm in, you know, a lot of immaturities. Um, and then I'm not going to lie. It was just, it was girls. I was like, I'm cool. Like, <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not, I don't know. I was just so scared. That was the word. I was scared. And they hired this lady. Um, she stayed only one season. And my first head coaching job was actually pulling on my high school that same year. I interviewed for Point Loma as a favor to a family uh, that uh, played AAU with us and because his daughter was coming up. He said, you owe me a favor. So I interviewed. I got the job. I only stayed there six weeks in the summer because I couldn't get a job on campus. <laughs> so I didn't. Uh, they didn't give me a job on campus. I was like, okay, well, I appreciate it. I'm back to San Diego High because Ali taught me to run a great program. You have to be on campus. And that's one thing I learned from him. And he said, not a good program, a great program. You can be successful being an off-campus coach. You can be, without a doubt. But to be great, it's that much easier if you have an on-campus coach. Totally and true. so that was the whole thing for me was I was already a security in the district. Like, hey, just transfer me over here. So I show back. This is during summer school at San Diego High in the summer of 07. Uh, so I head back over to San Diego High. And they're like, hey, man, you good? I'm like, nah, I just resigned at uh, – at Point Loma. And AD said, I'll be right back. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what he did, but he came right back and was like, okay, you can't say no. You're our new girls. Yeah, head coach. I'm like, what? He was like, yeah, the job. I'm like, what happened? to That's none of your concern. He was like, you're, it's a vacancy and you're our head coach. And I was like, whoa, you know, okay. 
Um, and he jumped the gun <laughs> uh, because I ended up having to interview for it because he didn't know he was still a young AD. Uh, but I won the interview, so that was pretty cool. Uh, it was hard, man, because San Diego High went from the Mike Tyson of girls basketball, the, the Maya Moores of women's basketball. I'm sorry, the Shardy Houston of women's basketball smacking people around to when Paris graduated, they dropped big time. Uh, and it wasn't like a negative thing. Like it was still some very talented, very, very talented young women. Uh, but, you know, you didn't have that girl like a Paris, a Chardé that's going to give you 30 without without no question. You know, um, so it was, you know, in my eyes, it was more rebuilding and trusting the great players that I had to become elite players. So what kind of uh, I mean, to go from never being a head coach. At a varsity mm-hmm. level, and at, have only coaching boys. What, tell me about the adjustments you had to make, or if there was any adjustments that you had to make. Not only jumping a level for the first time, but then also going from from boys to girls. The two adjustments I had to make was one, learning how to schedule. That's the only thing I didn't learn from Ollie. That was the only thing. Uh, but as far as practice plans, um, fundraising goals, um, you know, our meetings, uh, all those little things, I had that in play. Uh, the second hardest thing for me was I was holding back coaching. I wasn't coaching them like ball players. I was coaching them like girls. Cause I was in, I was in fear and the girls called me out on that. They, they, they came at me that the, the two juniors and the senior came at me and uh, basically, you know, it was like, Hey coach, here's the deal. You need to coach this like the way you were training Paris or rehab in Paris and the way you do the boys. Cause we would still let them hop into boys workouts. And I was like, but you guys are girls. And I, that actually came out of my mouth. And they're like, no, coach, we're ball players. It's something different. Mm-hmm. We're girls when we're off this court, but we're ball players. And you need to coach us as such. And I'll never forget that. And from that day forward, I, I coached the only way that I know how. And it brought, you know, great success. So talk about the success. So at what year, at, at how many years was it in that you won CIF? Year three. So talk about year the lead three. up from year one to year three. So when year two hit, Andrea was a junior. Uh, we had a great freshman, Tia Dixon, come in. She uh, transferred back here, military brat. Uh, she was already offered a scholarship in eighth grade by Virginia. Uh, she was just freaking phenomenal. Could just go. Um, Andrea was our junior, our center. And then we had another kid that ended up getting a four-year scholarship, Amy Calloway, that was just a baby. They came in and she was great at blocking shots and rebounding the best I've ever seen with just body control. And she developed to offensive kids. So at the conclusion of year two, we lost, I forget who we lost to in the playoffs, but in my office, I had, in my office, I had a wall, you know, this wall, short wall before you walked out. And one of my seniors asked to sign it. And it just kind of turned into a little tradition where if you're a senior, you can sign at the conclusion of the year. Well, Andrea, I knew she was going to be a good coach back then. Andrea, as a junior, grabbed the marker. I'm like, Birdie, what are you doing? That's for the seniors. And she's like, leave me alone, Coach Lonnie, and just started writing. Right? And the message said, I love you, Coach Lonnie. I promise that I will win you your first CIF title next season. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. And she gave me the pen and was like, you better not erase this. And walked out. And I'm like, okay. So the next season comes, uh, you know, we were playing good basketball, man. We're all sophomore, sophomore loaded. Uh, Tia Dixon, Alexis Harris, Tatiana Etheridge, Amy Calloway. Uh, again, we are loaded um, that year. And, you know, it was just, again, it was crazy. You know, the, the talent of these kids we had, Jay Taylor was a freshman, Leah Brown. Um, you know, we had just had some great kids and, we ended up playing Poway in December, who we eventually met in the finals. And let me tell you something right now about a great coach, man. This man, I learned a lot from Jay Truesdale that year. And there's a reason why he's the all-time winning his coach, girls in San Diego. Uh, he put a whooping on us, a whooping on us in December. I felt we had the best press in the county. Uh, that was our bread and butter. Traps everywhere, killing teams. And he cut through it like a hot knife through butter. It was just I was frustrated. I didn't know what to do. So after that game, you know, back then we didn't have the open. It was division one. Um, 
it was a division. It was Division One, Division Two by enrollment. Size. Yeah, yeah. So you know, we had you know the Poways, the Lacasse Canyons. We had some heavyweights, and I was like, I know we're going to meet them in the playoffs. So the rest of that year, I was like, you know what, man, we're gonna we're gonna give a little bit of time every day to Poway. And again, I, I give credit where credit's due. Uh, I had two cameras filming Poway at different games. One camera on Jay and one camera on the game, because uh, Jay he can't really yell. Uh, everything with him is, you know, hand signals, you know, head tap, chin, and his girls respond to it. So I learned that. I learned his patience, um, his calmness, his demeanor. So, you know, again, by the time it came around, we played him in the CF championship. And I, I finally figured out what we had to do. And we never pressed them once. We picked up man to man the entire game with Andrea Bird playing man. And we switched everything. And that caused a lot of fits for them. And we were in the game the whole game. And we ended up winning by six. The girls strung the court, <laughs> which was phenomenal. I, I stood on the chairs. I was, I was wrong. I didn't have coaching etiquette. I didn't know. I stood on the chairs, was pumping my fist to the crowd. And Birdie came back to me and just grabbed me and said, I told you. I told you. I'm a woman, I'm a woman of my word. I told you. And she ended up writing that on the board, too. I told you. <laughs> and. That's Andrea Bird, man. It's just those kind of stories give you goosebumps. You know, it's like you only see that stuff in movies and it really happened for us. So that was crazy. So, so. how so you how many more years were you at Dago? I stayed a total of I was at, I was the head coach at Dago from uh for five years. So I left after my fifth year as a head coach, but I was there for seven, seven so on I, campus. I told you just before the first one of the first time well, we had already met, but one of the one of the first vivid conversations I remember was at AIU for a summer league game. And, mm -hmm. you know, Marlon in his classic Marlon voice was saying that <laughs> he heard you, was, you were going to be the head coach of Mira Mesa and you was just uh, adamant that you weren't going to be and you didn't know what he was right. talking about. And then, uh, you know, so walk me through that process of you, you know, saying you didn't want to <laughs> do it and then be eventually becoming the head coach there at Mira Mesa. Well, you know, Amy, Amy was like a daughter to me. Um, so, when I was no longer a head coach, I coached at Horizon for a year in 12, 13, 13, 14. I go work at Mira Mesa High School and I'm in love being there as a regular security guard, a regular person, big Lonnie, not coach Lonnie. And for me, one of the transitions I had was I had such a bond with Callaway that I was trying to be in Vegas as much as I could. You she know, was playing I, UNLV. I, yeah, she's at UNLV and she was the youngest starter in school history at 17. Didn't turn 18 to her sophomore year. So, you know, for me, it was uh, she's the closest I've ever had to a daughter. Um, you know, the bond that, that, that we shared back then, it was just it was crazy. So for me, I was like, you know what? I'm enjoying hopping on this 15 freeway, going north, checking this kid out. And at Mira Mesa, uh, some people there just assumed automatically I was there for basketball. And it shocked them when I wasn't in the gym, when I wasn't talking to any players. I was honestly, Hasin, I was content at not coaching again, not being a head coach. Uh, I truly feel I'm a better assistant coach than I am a head coach. I mean, you know, as a head coach, you, you've been both now. As a head coach in the I middle know of the I'm game, a better assistant coach than a head coach. I yeah. know it. I won't let anybody tell me anything <laughs> different. I know. <laughs> you, you know, you know how it is, man. We can't, we don't got the same amount of time to talk to a kid in the middle of a game as our assistants do. You know, we're in parent meetings while our assistants are running workouts. You know, we're in admin meetings where our assistants are running workouts. You know, again, you got to have great assistants to have a great program. And I, I, in all my schools, I've been fortunate to have that. Um, and it's just, you know, again, I was just really adamant with never being a head coach. And I ended up getting called into the office at Mira Mesa. Um, they opened up the basketball position. They were, they were, you know, making some changes. And basically I was told, hey, man, do you like working here? I was like, yeah, why? I'm like, okay, well, you need to apply for the basketball job or you need to go to another school. <laughs> I'm like, what? Both ways. <laughs> yeah, you can't have it both ways. I'm like, what? They're like, yeah, at least if you apply, you acknowledge this. Yeah. If you don't apply, we're going to ask you to move on. And I'm like, wait a minute, what did I do wrong? And they're like, nothing. What happened was, look, and they showed me these emails. It was like over 100 emails. Uh, what happened was there was a young lady named Jesse Johnson whose sister, she graduated, and her sister was on the current team. Uh, Janelle Johnson. So I'm on the golf cart and I'm driving to go. And this is super funny. 
So I'm driving to go to the back of the school to lock my golf cart up and go home. It's like 3.30. And they got basketball practice. So they're all sitting in the lunch area. You know what I'm talking about, the little lunch area right there by the gym. This girl jumps in front of the golf cart. And I have to slam on the brakes. And I'm like, whoa. Like, you know, I almost hit her. And I'm like, yo, what are you doing? I'm hot. She's like, oh, my God, you're Coach Lonnie. And all the girls on the team looked at me. And I was like, nah. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. I played against like, you for four years. Yeah. It's like <laughs> Winston like, University all over again, right? Dude, it was crazy. She's like, <laughs> I played against you for four years, and you guys kicked our butts, and blah, 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 blah. You coached Tia Dixon, and I had to guard her, and I couldn't guard her, and blah, 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 blah. So all these girls are like, Coach Lonnie. Now, that's Big Lonnie, the dude that hosts our pep rallies. So, you know, uh, one of the girls, Haley Mayhew, she wasn't on the team. She didn't want to play at that time, but she knew who I was as well. Her dad's a teacher there, and I coached against her older sister who was on uh, uh, the team with Johnson, with Jesse. Mm -hmm. And so, again, I got called in, you know, I got called in a few weeks later. Um, this is towards the end of their season. So it was a few weeks later and uh, roughly. And, you know, they didn't tell me about the first wave of emails. They didn't tell me about that. But they told me about the second wave of emails. And it was like, I want to say it was like the last week of the season they were practicing. So, you know, some time go by. I get that little ultimatum. Uh, and I really love Mayor Mason, man. They adopted me. The community was cool. It was a long drive, but it was a cool campus to work on, man. The vibe was cool. The staff was phenomenal. The kids were great. So I prayed on it and, you know, I was like, what's more important, happiness at work? And I was like, I need that. So I applied, uh, you know, and then Marlon was telling you all that stuff. And, you know, Marlon, he, he's the GOAT. Uh, you know, that dude, he's like a dog. You know how your dog can just sniff something out? and You know, your carpet is clean, but somehow your dog find a piece of cracker. That's Marlon, man. That dude, <laughs> that dude knows everybody's stuff, man. He's just, you know, he's the godfather. So he knew, um, I, was, I didn't want really people to know what was going on because I wasn't sure if I was going to commit to it. And uh, I ended up committing to it and, and did our thing. So what this is, well, <laughs> I'm trying to be uh, PC knowing okay. that I coach there now, but it's uh, obviously a different style of kid. It's a different kid that you're coaching. Yep. It's a different kid that you have to relate to at Mary Mesa versus San Diego high. Yep. What was that adjustment like? Um, I didn't have the killers. I like the, the kids I had at San Diego high, even the 13th, 14th man on the team had the mentality of we're going to go out here and smack you. You know what I'm saying? Like winning became contagious and they all loved it and they wanted more. They wanted more. They wanted more. Um, I always believed that Mira Mesa had talent because even the teams that I coached against, I was like, damn, this girl could be really good. This other kid could be really good. So actually Mira Mesa had an African-American girl. I forgot her name. But she was super freaky, um, you know, athletic athleticism, the way, she, you know, jump, run. She had everything. She ended up going to San Diego State for track. And then, thank God, Beth Burns, you know, found her. She's like, come on in this gym. And, you know, she ended up playing, I want to say, two years at State. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, I forgot her name. Uh, if I remember, I'll mention it. But this this young lady was phenomenal. And I just remember saying, like, if if I, you know, I can win with this team, with this group, but you're right. They had to learn how to win. They had to learn that they were special and they had to learn a work ethic, a true work ethic, not show up hour and a half, two and a half hours, practice, go home. You know, when you got, when you got plays called turn up, you know, what, what teams don't take that serious? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So they had literally had a play. They told me that the old coach had called turn up. We're going to run, we're going to run a turn up. And I'm like, <laughs> not a good play to say to kids, but. Uh, again, just how to teach them to believe, uh, how to win, how to compete. And once we did that, they, they took over, they, they took control of the boat from there in the ship. It was their ship. So what was that first year like? Cause I know, you know, is it a bit of an adjustment? You guys ended up having hard. a, you had the number one seed and the season didn't kind of end how you wanted it. So, so kind of well, tell me how, how you felt after season one, what's your mindset after season one, getting ready for season two? Okay, well, the first part you asked me was it, how hard was it, right? Yeah. I think you said uh, what made it hard was um, the, the assistant coach who was no longer part of our staff, who's a great man and a great friend of mine, a brother of mine now, uh, Alvin Mendoza. It was hard because his daughter was the freshman point guard. So for me, it was hard replacing that coaching staff and 
uh, and, you know, the daughter did a tremendous job when it was said and done. Finally, when she, when she knew that I was about the kids and not about me, she did, uh, Drew Mendoza did a phenomenal job uh, adjusting and showing her maturity. And I'm thankful for that. Which uh, couldn't be easy, you know, like you said. It, it was not easy. Mm -hmm. No, she, she definitely grew up fast. Because, you know, yeah, some other kids was like, oh, yeah, you're not going to get the ball so much more. You know, your family ain't here. You know what I'm saying? When in all honesty, she did deserve the ball on that group because she was one of the better ball handlers. You know, you had Clarissa Tate, who was phenomenal as well. Yeah. Um, but, you know, going into them playoffs, we were the last place team in Division Three that, yeah, Division Three. We were one point away from being Division Four, And that season started, we're the last place team in D3. The season ends, we're number one seed going into playoffs. Uh, I'm gonna be honest, and I told my kids this: we're not the number one seed. I, you know, I truly, you know, knew Rancho Bernardo was better. Um, you know, again, we would have to play almost perfect basketball. Well, not perfect basketball, but very good, very, very good basketball to beat them. And we almost did. We almost did. But I'm, I'm, I would never lie to people. I always, you know, I'm gonna keep it 100. They were the better team. They should have won D1 that year. Uh, they beat a good friend of mine, Bracy uh, and Kearney, in the finals. Uh, no disrespect to Bracey, he had a great team, but I do feel that year that the more the better team in Division Three was the Rancho Bernardo, uh, uh, yeah, RB. So, so it was, yeah, it, it was a good vibe though. It was a good vibe because again, everybody was excited about what we got, what we got moving forward. Well, I was about to say, even though you, you guys, part of you are feeling a little bit of disappointment being the number one seed, yeah. but then there also has to be part of you that thinks you're you're ahead of schedule, right? That you know, we were definitely is, ahead. So knowing that you're ahead of schedule, turning the page into year two, kind of give me an idea of what the mindset is going into that, that year two. That was ultimately oh, a very successful year two. Year two, man, I, I told the girls, I was like, it's a buffet, let's eat. And they were with it. <laughs> they had their steak knives and everything. And I was like, first thing I did was, I was like, who do y'all want to play? And, you know, I, you know, they told me a couple of teams. We found them in tournaments for different reasons. And that was part of teaching the kids on, one, how to, you know, have maturity uh, when playing, you know, a rival game type deal, what they consider a rival. Uh, so that prepped them for the playoffs because, you know, Oceanside was, was a tough game for us in the playoff that year. Uh, and so was in the final against uh, Hilltop. So we, we played them twice. Ironically, we beat them earlier. Uh, but the reality is we had two really good freshmen, too, that stepped in. We had Janelle uh, Hoffdowling. Who, who, you know, she's, what is she, top five in San Diego history and three-pointers made and number one in three-pointers made in the game, yep. 16 in the game. And then we also have, you know, again, blessings come. And Bella, you know, yeah, look at that smile, Haas. Huh? Yeah, that's one your girl favorites. right there. One of my favorites. <laughs> hey, man, one of the best kids I've ever coached personality-wise and talent-wise ever, ever. So and you can agree with that. So Definitely. Bella came in. So, you know, now we have, you know, we had the senior backcourt with, uh, or they juniors. They were juniors. juniors. Clarissa juniors. Tate, yeah, juniors. Mm -hmm. Clarissa Tate, Drew Mendoza, and then we had that freshman combination come in, and then we also had Monique Morsero, uh, who was an unsung hero in Mira Mesa. Uh, she was a Mira Mesa kid, moved out the community, and came back, and was actually a stud in softball. Was a Division One talent in softball. Gave up playing softball, and hopped on the basketball court with us, and she was a rebounding machine. So. Year two, again, I just, you know, again, I asked them, so what do y'all want? They said, we want it all. I said, practice is going to be harder. All right? Practice is going to be harder. Okay? The quicker we get better, the easier practice get. You know, we'll tone it down. And they bought in. They believed. The families bought in. They believed. And uh, we had a goal. We put it on the board. And we were just checking them off. Everything checking off. And when, when the girls saw those checks, they're like, this, this could turn into a reality. And it turned into one. You know, we ended up knocking off Oceanside. Uh, which was great, you know, great for the community. First title in school history in boys or girls basketball and first title in a major sport. You know, football didn't, didn't have one at the time or, or still doesn't. So, you know, as of right now, that, that 2016 team is embedded in history at Mira Mesa. And I always tell kids, leave your legacy. So when you come back with that letterman on, you can be like, hey, tell your daughter or son, I put that on the wall. That's, that's my team. Leave your legacy. I, I look at... Every day I look at the wall. Every time I'm in there, it's it's it, I mean, it sounds sounds corny or sounds cheesy, but it, it when you 
to have those names and those years up there, um, mm -hmm. it's immortalized. And, you know, you come back in the mm -hmm. gym and it's a sense of pride. So what with buzzer sounds, your CIF champion, how does it feel? Uh, obviously, it's not the first one, um, but what's the sense of you, like you don't want to compare your children, obviously, right? But how does it compare to mm -hmm. winning at San Diego? Because I have to feel like this is, you, you know, when you were at Dago, like you said, there was a lot of talent mm -hmm. there and you, you kind of took over a program that had yeah. a history of winning. So what's the different feeling winning a, with basically an upstart program with no real history of winning? You know, personally, <clears throat> there's nothing like your first in anything, you know. So personally, you know, San Diego High, is, it's, a, it's a different pedestal for that first. Uh, realizing that I helped, that I helped a school, a community achieve a first for them. I, it was more like uh, that proud dad moment, kind of, you know, when your kid takes their first steps or the, your kid graduates college. It was like one of those, like, you know, you know, you helped your child kind of deal. Uh, it was just, it was so amazing that the entire community uh, just took it in. Boys, girls, uh, the eighth graders, the seventh graders at Wagenheim and Challenger. Mira Mesa is a different animal, man. It is a different place and i mean that in a good way uh you know as long as you're a quality person they're gonna love on you regardless of your record and you know that's the special thing about mirror mason now the winning part of it was just the icing on the, you know was the cherry on top basically and uh it, it it felt good knowing that a madman system works north of the eight it, that that really felt good it was very humbling very very humbling and in all honesty, on a personal level, I never give myself credit for coaching. That was never me. But after that, I was like, damn, bro, you coached your butt off. You know what I'm saying? Like, you really did. And, you know, it was humbling. So, again, it's two separate pedestals, but they're, they're, they're right there. They're, you know, just two different mountains. So – I want to obviously we, we've come we come full circle you end up at Lincoln and yeah I know the Lincoln job is something that you know was kind of always out there for you so I, I'm, a, I'm a North mm -hmm. Carolina basketball fan and I make the uh I'm going to compare you to Roy Williams and the reason okay. why I make that comparison is because I remember when Roy Williams was at Kansas when um coach Dean Smith retired and mm -hmm the opportunity was presented him to take, to come back to Carolina. And it just, for whatever reason, didn't seem right. And mm -hmm. then uh, after it didn't work out with um, Matt Doherty, the opportunity was there again and he took it. So I mm -hmm. kind of make the same parallels with you in terms of, I know before you actually took the Lincoln job a couple years ago, it was kind of something that was out there before. So what was the thing that made it the right move when you made it versus the other times when you, when you didn't really make that leap? <clears throat> Uh, Rod Cooksey, the coach I would replace, and uh, the AD and the administration. I know there was going to be an admin change. I didn't know who was going to be there. But number one was Roger Cooksey, uh, former Lincoln alum. He's two years behind me. Uh, hell of a basketball player, great football player, uh, great father, great man. Is. One of the realest dudes there is, man. <laughs> you know, I know some people didn't – I know a couple parents didn't care for him. but One of the realest you know, dudes again, I know. <clears throat> again, never lied to you, gave you his heart. Uh, he called me and told me he was stepping down for different reasons. And he said, you know, bro, you better take this job. <laughs> hornet to hornet, you know, and that's like a sacred bond. That's like, you know, um, you know, the fraternity type deal or the, the Mason, you know, it's a sacred bond. And, you know, I had to pray on it. I did. Uh, like I said, man, Mira Mesa was just work-wise – it couldn't get, I couldn't be at a better place. I was just so happy going to work every day. Uh, again, the community adopted me. They, you know, they fed me, they clothed me. They were there when I had gastric bypass. Uh, you know, again, they just, they, the community loved on me and the faculty, everybody was great, man. And that's what makes is. that place a special place. Is. They still love yeah, me. Yeah, it is. Don't say was. It is. <laughs> oh, my bad. Thank you, man. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. uh, so Cooksey hit me uh, and then I got a phone call right after him from the AD. I was like, hey, man, we're opening this up. Uh, need you to apply, brother. I talked to you before, uh, you know, in the past, you know, through, you know, simple conversations. The job's open. Need you, need you to apply. I was like, you know, I prayed on it. So 
Again, Cooksey was one. I believe things come in three. So Cooksey called. The AD called, asked me what I'd be interested in putting my application in. And then the third thing was later that day, I got a phone call from one of the new members of administration and uh, a text message before that from a, a higher, higher up in our school district that said, hey, man, you're going to be getting a call. Uh, you know, we need you at link. And they didn't know they had no clue about that, the, the basketball part of it. Like that administration didn't know basketball came open. So. For me, when those three things came into play, I was like, you know, this is God talking, man. This is God talking. Like, I got to answer it. And it was so hard. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, it was hard leaving a kid like Nay, uh, Jawan Gore, uh, uh, Angelique Tout, uh, Shimmerhorn. Um, you know, I had the incoming freshman. You know, little little one was coming. Uh, so the bonds that we had, uh, you know, uh, Tony, uh, Giselle, you know, the bonds that were there with those kids and those families, man, it was it was so hard, Haas. It was so hard. And like the administration told me, if you were leaving to any other school but Lincoln, we would hate you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we, we would hate you. We would be on you. We would be <laughs> coming after you. Uh, so they supported me. When I said, hey, man, I'm considering taking the Lincoln job that has been offered. They're like, nope, you've always talked about your coaching career going full circle and you going back where you started. And, you know, what we didn't talk about in this meeting that we did last time was the great coaches that I did have at Lincoln before my junior year. You know, I had Charlie Polk, Jose Hall, Earl Woolridge. You know, Charlie Polk played in the NBA. Um, I'm working on something right now at the school. I'm going to try to get the court named after him, the Charlie, Pur Char uh, Charlie Polk Court. And Dot Robinson, the only African-American female AD in our district at the time uh, for years. There was no other black female AD. And she was a phenomenal mentor coach. And I would like to get our gym, the building name, the Dot Robinson, you know, gymnasium. Uh, so those are some goals that I'm working with alumni on for the school to, to pay respect. Uh, but it was hard, Haas. I mean, again, like I said, man, Mira Mesa was just a different beast. It was a nice beast. It was the greatest people, but none of them, when they knew I went home, I had none but support and I, I respect them for that. And that's why I still try to do what I can to help, you know, when I can, whenever. So including Marion, one of our former players Saturday. <laughs> I heard about that. Speak on that while we're at it. Tell me about that <laughs> minister, minister Jones. I'm not an official minister Jones, but I am a certified and ordained to marry uh, through the great uh, World Wide web. Uh, uh, Universal Life Church. So nice. I got a, I got a call last year, uh, late last year from Haley Mayhew. And I thought she was joking. I knew she was inviting me to the wedding, but she was like, oh yeah, we need you to marry us. So I thought she was just kidding. I'm like, yeah, I'll be there. And I was like, wait, what date is it? She's like, July 17th. I'm like, that's my lady's birthday. And she was like, coach, you know, can I talk to her? I said, no, my lady's a great woman. She, she's down with something like this. And then I was like, okay, I'll talk to you later. And she goes, no, we're not done. Like, for real, you're going to marry us. Like, me and MJ talked about this. And I'm like, what? Her dad called me. You know how Mike Mayhew is. So he calls me. I'm chopping it up with him. And, you know, I can't, you can't say no. But I say yes in hopes that, it, that a no would eventually. <laughs> or <God laughs> I was just joking. Or, yeah, or God would eventually take over. And they'd be like, no, coach, we found somebody else. Or, you know, we, his family wants to do something different. Like, I was like, please, Lord, let that happen. Please, Lord. It didn't. It didn't. So uh, I actually got legally ordained. Uh, her wedding was this past Saturday. My lady and I, we went down there. Coach Lonnie had on the suit, the tie, uh, had my book. <laughs> Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today. <laughs> That's awesome. That is awesome. And uh, man, it was, it was, you know what, Haas? That's what coaching is about, man. Mm -hmm. The wins and losses at the end of the day, Haj, you can't tell me who won Division Five three years ago. You know what I'm saying? You could be like, wow, who won Division Three in 2016? My dumb ass, ooh, I'm sorry, my dumb behind might be like, I'm not sure. Uh, it was Mir Mesa. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, it's about the relationships. Man, that's it, man. And, mm -hmm. and that's what we don't have. I'm sorry to venture off, bro, but that's what we don't have. We don't have those kind of bonds no more in our coaching fraternity. And we got too many of those, you know, little Billy's dad or, you know, little Nicole's mom. Your coach sucks. Your coach sucks. But that same coach 
when your kid broke down or was crying because you lost, you know, for whatever reason, you had no food on the table. We showed up and put $300 worth of food in your household. You forgot about that. Mm -hmm. But we're the worst coach when we lose a game that maybe we shouldn't have lost. No, that's called basketball. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's called sports. Mm -hmm. So the wins and losses for me, Haas, and the CIF titles, what happened this past Saturday don't mean a damn thing. Don't mean nothing, man. Those are the wins and losses <clears throat> that I'm about. Well, as much as I agree <laughs> with you, we have to talk about, you know, right. what you accomplished in year one. Um, and, you know, we played you guys that year. Um, mm -hmm. Thought we had a good that was game a hard plan. Game. Thought we had a good that was game a hard plan. Game. Uh, one of my former players who was also one of your former players and hmm. now your current assistant coach, um, you know, she busts me up for some threes because we wanted to let her shoot, let her. We, so the reason why I bring her up is because I know that because uh, of my history with her, your history with her, I can speak to it. Uh, I know there was yeah. had to be some butting of heads. You know what? She she was embracing at first, but then, you know, natural instinct take over because, you know, you program that way. Well, so there's a couple times she let me, she let me clarify off. real quick because it, yeah. it comes off as negative, but part of the problem right. is her IQ, right? She's such yeah. a smart player. And yeah, we always talk about what made Kobe great. It wasn't that people say he was a ball hog. It wasn't that he didn't trust his teammates. It's that he believed in himself more than he believed in anybody else. That's what makes him right. great. So somebody like right. Imani, it, it comes off as a negative. It presents as a negative, but right. what it really is is her supreme confidence in herself. Yeah, so I just want to make sure I clarify that. But go ahead. No, I got you on that. I mean, I think Imani is going to be a really good coach uh, when she puts her sneakers up. I think, <clears throat> and I don't mean this in a disrespectful way at all, because I have a great photo of Imani and myself uh, against OLP that year. I don't wear suits. I don't like wearing suits. And I had a suit on. She's right in front of me breaking a girl down. And it's a beautiful photo. And I'm right behind her. And I told her that's one of the best photos I've ever took in my life. And it's the biggest, probably one of the biggest coaching photos ever. I said, because it was a transition in that photo showed a transition of her and myself. And I don't mean this in a disrespectful way when I say this, but her IQ is above her ability. Um, I truly believe she's going to be a, 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 a really good coach if she takes it serious and she has, and she has a chance to be a great coach if she grows the passion for it. Um, she definitely can break film down with you. She'll sit down with you and it's like talking to, you know, again, she helped out this year. Uh, while San Diego State and all them had, you know, COVID and everything going on because she's at State, she was at the gym trying to get better, um, you know, for college. And, you know, now she's going to go to Saddleback and do some great things for Sierra Igohart. But Imani, you know, and I'm so proud of this young lady because she had great talks with the girls this year, talks that I didn't expect her to have, where it really showed her maturity. She talked about the negatives, uh, which, again, showed a lot of growth. Uh, she talked about the positives. Uh, you know, she talked about a lot of stuff that I didn't think personal where I didn't think she would touch base on. She was telling the kids about, you know, parent etiquette, uh, demeanor, what you got to do, you know, and she reverted back to when uh, <laughs> the last season you and I coached together, where if you remember this, she hit a three at the end of the third quarter. They were down four and she hit that bomb and she got fouled. We both agreed she got fouled. Rev didn't call it, goes through the net. She turns around, starts staring at me and, our, and then, beating her chest saying this is my gym while her teammates were trying to you know jump on her and be like yeah let's go and I looked at you and I'm not gonna say what I told your daughter but you agreed <laughs> <laughs> yeah I remember we talked about that one a lot <laughs> I'm not gonna say what I said to your daughter but you know what I said to your daughter she know what I said and you know basically you know we told her don't let her score another point well as soon as that game ended Haas we were cleaning the gym and if you remember I called Imani she was in the car driving home with her mom, put me on speakerphone. And I said, Imani, you played a great game, but you know where you lost the game at? She goes, where? I said, you hit that three on us. She said, how, how did I lose the game there? I said, because it was about you. You gave so much attention to Coach Lonnie for no reason. There's no beef with you and I. But you gave so much attention to me that you didn't give that energy to those girls that were trying to hug on you and love on you. And I said, they didn't absorb that energy when they saw how you were just too focused on me and Cooksey had to get you turned back to them. You lost it. And when I came to Lincoln, she was like, you know, Coach Lyon, you, when you said that to me, it stuck with me so much. And uh, again, her transition, her growth, uh, you know, I did tell her, I did tell everybody, it's my way or the highway. I did tell the parents in the parent meeting, like, look, senior parents, I don't need y'all to do anything. Just show up, enjoy your seniors, 
and senior night is yours. Don't worry about fundraising. Don't worry about doing nothing else. Let me coach. You know, uh, junior parents, sophomore parents, I'm going to come to y'all to help with snack bars and stuff like that. And at the end of the day, everybody played their part. And, you know, again, we were just successful. And I think one of the biggest things I did was taking money off the point. Uh, I felt the ball in coaching against her. I wanted the ball in her hands. I felt their team couldn't get in rhythm. And I felt she held it too long because her mind was seeing exactly what should happen, but her ability level wasn't in, in sync with it. That also, kind of mingle to you, it makes sense. Also, also, her teammates, she was seeing things her teammates didn't see. Exactly. Backdoor cuts they didn't see. You know, a post player was ceiling, didn't realize they were ceiling over the top passes, which was turnovers. So, you know, you know, again, because I know what she was going to do, I had to tone that down some. So, you know, we put Maria at the point, and then with Imani, we let her play the two, the three, the four. You know, you, know, you go zone on us, we'll put her at the free throw line. Let her work the high post. And, you know, she was killing teams, career highs in every category. And I was so proud of her, man, because, again, three years strong, ball dominate, heavy guard. You know what I'm saying? To take it away from her for the majority of the game and say, you're playing off the ball. And she ended up embracing it. And I told her, I said, believe me, stats will tell the truth. And they did. And then, you know, again, she has some great teammates around her that uh, the county didn't know about, but they found out about. What, so. what is that feeling like? As an alumni, you know, coming back year one yeah. for that, for, for to be able to, to say you brought that championship back to Lincoln, what did that mean for you? I mean, it was surreal. I mean, it was like, it was kind of like Mira Mesa all over again. Cause when I took over Mira Mesa, I want to say in, in two years combined, they had like eight wins or something like that. And then the year before, before I took over, they had like five wins. So for us to do the night and day turnaround was, was, was something else. And then at Lincoln, it was the same thing. You know, I mean, Coach Cooksey, let me be clear, regardless of record, hell of a coach, hell of a coach. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, again, the ball, he played a tough schedule that year. He was in a tough league. He played a tough schedule. He didn't run from nobody. And, you know, they, they lost some ball games and that happens. And so when I took over, they had five wins and there was only two returning starters, which was Imani and Maria. Lala, people really didn't know about Lala. The year before, Lala hit some shots on us. I was like, who the hell is number four? And she played JV the game before and in varsity against us. And, you know, I talked to Cooksey about her. And, you know, he was like, Lon, she's going to be good. And I was like, man, I agree with you. And, you know, Lala stepped onto the scene, did some great things. And then this year, her junior year, she really blew up. So, um, you know, again, you know, I didn't know who Lala was. Uh, you know, we when you and I coached against Lincoln, they also had those two phenomenal rebounding bigs. Uh, they ended up, one of them ended up playing at City, I believe, but those girls found everything. So, you know, it was hard because when I took over, I only had Imani, Maria, and Lala for workouts. Uh, you know, Jada, Jada was, Jada Hughes was a cheerleader. Uh, you know, the, Regina Littleton was a cheerleader. Uh, Tiari Jones, a cheerleader. Uh, Michaela was, was working. You know, we didn't have Aaliyah Crawford was working. You know, we really didn't have bodies, man. So I didn't know what I was going to have going into the year. When we played in, in, in the event morning through, did you guys tell the Mayor Mesa? That was the first time I had a, a whole team. First time. Never at a practice. A workout. That was in October. <laughs> right before that was the season October, right before, right, right before we started to kick off. Mm -hmm. That was my first time having a whole group. You know, so, you know, again, Imani, though, phenomenal. I'm so proud of her, man. She comes back. She's a great mentor. She matured night and day. She still got things she's working on, but she's night and day, man. Night and day. So I have to get into this because, like I said, the last time we could probably do a whole podcast on this alone. I'm really impressed with the 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 connection between you and uh, the boys coach, Jeff Harris. Uh, so I yeah. want you to take a little time to speak about coaches for racial equality and kind of what you guys are doing yeah. uh, in our in our in not just our basketball community, but in, in the community in general. Yeah, well, you know, Jeff Harper Harris, <clears throat> uh, Coach Jeff, everybody calls him, has been a phenomenal fixture in our community since he moved here. Uh, what was it? His sophomore year, I believe. He's he's has family here, but he's originally from Dayton. He had family here. Uh, he has just been a phenomenal person, as far as just complete person, but even more phenomenal in pushing, increase the violence. I mean, increase the peace events to stop the violence. He's been doing that for years out of Jackie Robinson. Why? Character building. Uh, he's just, again, 
he's so easy to work with his love, his passion, his desire for everybody to stay alive, stay successful, um, stay aware is second to none. Uh, you know, he suffered some tragedies in his life. Um, you know, we all have, you know, but he lost his two brothers to gang violence and he turned their losses into gains by his passion for the youth and keeping their, keeping kids off the streets. So the Cougars, him and Marlon Wells are cut from a similar cloth and myself. It's not about just Southeast. It's about all the kids around the county. So he had kids as far as, you know, Torrey Pines, Temecula coming down to play for him. So our, our bond is, is second, you know, it was just a really good bond, a really great fit at Lincoln. Uh, he started racial, uh, coaches for racial equality last year after one of his players, you know, contacted him about, you know, the death of, of, of uh, George Floyd. And, you know, he just had some real questions. And that's what I love about him. It, it, there's nothing edited. It's going to be a real question. What are you doing for your black athletes? What are you doing for your minority athletes? How are you talking to them? And now this group is so great. We have John Pierce from Mayor Mason involved. Uh, you know, yourself have been on some calls. We have uh, uh, Lisa from BSN involved, Mike Hop from Saints. And what this group is about is, one, being open and honest. Two, uh, we're not judging you. We're trying to help you. So we're bridging the gap. So little things like a John Pierce didn't realize, we mentioned it how we see it. And John Pierce is like, whoa, whoa. And now he's comprehending. We're not asking you to understand day one. We're asking you to comprehend just a little bit and then let it grow on you. And this group is just phenomenal. Mike Brunker leads it now. And I think one of the calls got up to like 100 some people one time. Uh, so, you know, right now, it's just, again, it's a phenomenal group. We're going to do an event for MLK Day, uh, Coaches for Equality uh, MLK event. Over at the Hive, we're working on that now. We'll, we'll get that out to coaches. But again, we just want to keep bringing knowledge that you know our uh, that, that racist being racist it's a disease, and you know we just want to keep opening people's eyes to opportunities to making change in a positive way and loving one another. We might have to get different skin tones, but God made us all the same. Like I'm looking at you now, Hodge. You got two arms, two legs, a nose like me, right? doesn't make me any better than John Pierce. It doesn't make me any better than anybody else. We're all God's children. And we're trying to get away from looking at uh, the color and looking at who we are and loving one another, standing up for one another, regardless of our skin tone. Right is right. Wrong is wrong. So that group has just been phenomenal. Uh, great people. And, you know, I'm excited about the future of it. And I just pray more people hop on instead of saying things like, well, I don't coach minority athletes or I don't got that demographic. Like, no, no, you do. You do. You have a coworker that has a son that's your friend. You know what I'm saying? You you have somebody. You grew up with somebody. So we all got to be love one another, man, and, and just understand that, you know, right is right and wrong is wrong and love is love. So while we're on the topic, I want to definitely get your, your take on the, yeah. the Coronado situation, kind of yeah. uh, not really the situation because the situation is what it is. I'm more interested in your, your take on kind of the fallout uh, post the incident, kind of the I know I've, I've expressed my opinion on as, as heinous as mm -hmm. I felt the situation was, I didn't really see the point in vacating the championship. I felt like those kids earned yeah. a championship on the court. Uh, so just kind of what's your perspective on kind of how the whole, the whole thing played out and kind of where we are with it now? You know, normally I'm quick to hop on something. This one here, I took a little time to assess everything. Uh, one, the kids shouldn't have had their title vacated. Uh, I believe that they've earned that. They won the basketball game. Not one time did anybody say anything about dirty play, cheating. foul play, cheating. None of that was ever said. So what happened post-game is post-game, and post-game consequences should happen then. During the game, the championship was won, and it should stay with Coronado and that team. Uh, post-game, unfortunately – uh, some adults made some bad decisions, some bad actions. Some kids made some bad decisions, bad actions. And it uh, definitely opened an eye uh, for everything that's going on. Um, for me, the reason why I got kind of quiet was because I wanted to see how much support that Orange Glenn would get uh, in this situation. 
how much support Coronado would get. Because at the end of the day, uh, I believe that they lost a good head coach at Coronado. I believe he knew his basketball and he was doing some good things. Uh, you know, do I know if he knew about everything? I don't. Uh, but again, who's there supporting that man? Because as of right now, getting another coaching job is going to be hard. So for me, you know, we're so quick to kill somebody. Cancel coach. And we're, yeah, and we're not quick to try to build them back up. So, you know, eventually I would love for someone to recommend, if I can't think of it, I would love to help. But how do we help Coach Lapari? Um, you know, again, just be a human and be a great human and a functioning member of society. You know what I'm saying? And and hopefully get back on that sideline because at the end of the day, he did know what he was doing as a coach. You know, he knew his X's and O's. Um, the reason why I say I sat back quietly and watched was because it was amazing how many groups rallied. I was there for the for the uh, for the rally in front of the school, and these different groups came into play and. What kind of bothered me, though, I was happy, but I was bothered. Them same groups and other groups didn't rally for Lincoln. Two years in a row, Lincoln had a case once against San Clemente where kids were called monkeys in the N-word. Uh, it was an unsafe environment in San Clemente. Um, and then this year we had the Catholics versus convicts. And it, it was just, it's just so uh, heartbreaking the way all this went down and the lack of support was there. Um, and again, I'm not trying to downplay anything at Coronado. At the end of the day, you know, the kids are hurting. So what are we doing to help the kids? So, you know, again, uh, I'm glad that all these groups rally, uh, that they're helping Coronado. But what I would like to know is who's helping the girls basketball coach over there who's a Mexican man. You know, I know uh, I reached out and Coaches for Equality, you know, reached out. Uh, but I want to know if he's being supported. You know, I want to know if the Samoan coach in volleyball is being supported. They're the only minority coaches, to my understanding, on that staff. You know, who's supporting them? Uh, I want to know if, you know, all the kids are being supported fully. What about your Hispanic kids on that campus? Are they being called in, uh, being supported? You know, I haven't heard nothing about that. And again, it could be happening. But from the coach's standpoint, to my understanding, that's not happening at all. From the kid's standpoint, I'm not sure. But it was just, I don't know, it was very heartbreaking. It was sad for our city, our community. Um, it was god-awful that a man uh, in his 40s found it funny to bring tortillas. And, you know, out of his words in his interview, he felt, you know, that it was starting a new tradition. And not trying to be funny, but you never start a tradition on the last game of the year. I never heard of that in my life. And it was just, you know, again, I, I hope they ban him from anything Coronado. I really do. Um but at the end of the day, man, it's really heartbreaking uh, because, again, it's it's these kids are hurt, man. A title is vacated. Uh, the entire athletic program is on, on watch and suspension. They got to do all these classes for other kids and other coaches that have been doing things right. You know, they're affected now. Um, so, again, Haas, this is a touchy subject. Um, you know, I might have some people to see this interview hate me more. And, you know, again, uh, I'm fine with that. Uh, at the end of the day, we got to do what's best for the kids, uh, regardless of where they live at, what school they play for. Wrong is wrong and right is right. Uh, you know, as coaches, we've all made mistakes here and there. Uh, you know, again, what are we doing to build back care? What are we doing to help our Coach Lapari? What are we doing to help the Orange Glen community? You know, what are we doing to help the Coronado community instead of just bury, bury, bury somebody? <laughs>